Welcome to the first Poets' Voice reading of the year and to the outset of our fall 2014 season of public programs, which includes readings, seminars, workshops, and performances by Susan Howe, Ariana Rains, Johannes Gorenson, Linda Level, Dan Beachy Quick, Peter O'Leary, Helen Bendler, David Hinton, Fanny Howe, and the Poetry Room's own Chloe Garcia Roberts. <laughs> She's not working on my, on my hours, uh, on her poetry. Um, I want to thank Professor Stephanie Sandler for being an ongoing conspirator in bringing some of the best and most provocative voices and minds to campus. So thank you, Stephanie. Almost none of the poetries I admire, writes C.D. Wright, stick to their labels, native or adoptive ones. Rather, they are vagrant in their identifications, tramp poets. Not only does CD's observation, circa 2005, allow me to use the phrase two tramps when I refer to our readers this evening, but it also permits me to not quite know how to introduce them, as they may well have strayed from their last point of reference. CD's use of the phrase, do you get my drift in one with others, instead of do you understand me, takes on additional significance when considered in this light. The permission to drift over the course of a poem, of a book, of a career, permission to experiment in, and err in the course of one's own evolution as a human being in serious kinship with others. Terribleness, writes Jared Stanley, is there room in my manhood for such walking? As a reading organizer, it's fair to say I do not always know what I invite. I can only invite on past writings, and it is my job to welcome the present and the next. My introductions are therefore inevitably erroneous. But it's a good place for us to begin the semester in error and errancy. It's a good place to begin, period, with room in our man and or womanhood for such walking, such drift. I've been thinking about freedom this summer as it's been a summer that has tested so many notions of it. And I've also been considering whether personal freedom is not synonymous with the freedom to change, to drift. And it's in that light that I encountered the works of our two readers this evening. In his poem, How the Desert Did Me In, Jared writes, I found someone unfamiliar by me, insisting he'll drive. Late one night, he pulled over and grabbed a bull snake out of the brush. Everywhere we went, it was like that, this strewn person next to you. I, Jared writes, and then someone, and then he, and then it the snake, and then we, and then it the strewn person, and then you, and in so doing enacts this dexterous, hard word to say, pronounal commotion, this casual metamorphosis in a matter of three lines. Jared Stanley's and C.D. Wright's catalytic poems uh, relentlessly situate the unfamiliar by us whether it is the estrangement we have wrought on the land, as for Jared, the weeds are what he calls the intelligence of a disturbed earth, or what we have done to our fellow man by creating an overdose of prisons, as C.D. chronicles in One Big Self, or the institutionalism of racism in this nation, as she documents in One With Others. Their work actively and demandingly reminds us that by means at once nearby and made by us or condoned by us. In her most recent chapbook, which I'm gonna put on display after the reading, it's called The Other Hand, CD takes this one step further testing the metal of the phrase on the other hand by bringing the breadth and disruption of this rhetorical alternative of this otherness into the constraints of her own corporeal body and the conceptual body of a lyric poem. The other hand becomes her own hand, the automatic is made manual, the obscure and difficult are forced into conversation with the familiar. What is most challenging to us what is most apt to change us, it comes at us from everywhere. Reading's unfamiliar walking, writes Jared. Back then, C.D. writes in One With Others, we could not be having this conversation. 
tonight we can. Please welcome Jared Stanley and C.D. Wright. Hi, it's a great honor to be here. Thank you so much, Christina, for inviting me. Thanks to C.D. for reading with me, by me, near me, with. Uh, uh, I have a little bit of drip. I've just flown out of Reno, which has been completely covered in wildfire smoke for the last couple days, so I'll try not to let this interfere. Uh, the first poem is called The Listening. Since what's around them is called weather and is full of sounds, even determined people are subject to the listening they can't exclude. A tiny scavenger bird squawks and an ear just can't hide the suggestion the hairs try to pick out in its cry. Since the trials of friendship between the squawk, the ear, the hair, and the head are good, untimely but hopeful, though your hands cup their love against any extremity. All kinds of winds lick and suck on the ears as they practice the unseen, sticking out toward the outer limit of what being determined could mean. To ignore or insist or overlay a method of life or authentic mist over some totally admixed eardrum buzz or secret drone hum. You could try to stopper your mind, go deaf at concerts, hollow the resonant disc of the head to within a hair's breadth of a notion, but then you'd be measuring a silent aversion against the very thing determination was meant to destroy. Ears are an organ of fate. For you and me, though, whatever shape we, we may be, it's only physical to say how we could try and forget that we ever tried to detach a fond or aggressive quality from the swift gerunds in a day's weathering, the only kind we jab and jab our ears out into, determined to confuse tragedy with comedy, both in the ears' weird inflorescing and in their studious mishearings. Insects in circles surely must be making a strong cumulative gust about the head, taking the shape of an ampersand or the shape of a dick, though no sense organs, mistakings, could return the earth to the acoustic shape it presented right before the first memory hollowed out the second sound. As when a prophetic heat exhausts itself with a star metaphor, a thing a thing does to itself but which leaves all the ears of history in the light of a star they cannot bear to hear, oh well. That frees us up to run either of our heads over the Cleopatra coffee mug, the hard rice stuck to last night's placemat, the white paint fused to the flathead screwdriver's handle, the little cut on the Asian pear over there, the roll of plumber's tape, the postcard from Korea folded in half, a sack of mandarins, an illustration of shark morphology in a book left open on a table. I saw the figure five over the ampullae of Lorenzini, the shark's organ for perceiving electricity and slight muscle movement, for orienting the shark to the magnetic field of the earth. The illustrated ampullae can't sense my fingers' slight twitch, though their animate counterparts have been sensing pulses from the hearts of their prey for 65 million years, so they don't really need an outer ear or you to whisper the word extinction in high pitches in their ocean, and they don't even need a brain. It pulses about them up close under their snouts. It's happened before, their death, my death, and yours. But not even that focusing chill can return the earth to our existences spread across its surface, fine. The eye, the ear, the moment, none, fine. I never had any ampullae anyway, so I can't feel anything, barely oriented to the magnetic field of the earth, so nobody knows where in time I'm talking from and at, least of all nobody, that unfeeling slough determined to unfeel me, snob. <laughs> I'm sure I'm dead that the idea of November has been adjusted to reflect new realities, sagebrush habitat climbing the flank of the mountains naturally, burn them to desert, to the sound of a world. Deserts' weathers won't support much life that isn't low to the ground, 
and their main forms of communication with themselves are a revenant whistle over greasewood and shad scale. Sagebrush is a kind of wormwood. Relax. This specific emptiness, the deserts, is not about you, it's about nobody, but not about you specifically, though it doesn't mind if you use it as a place to store your feckless ears, curse its attention to your tiniest sounds. Grit in your teeth squeaks in time to your jaw. Nobody else can hear it, but you swallowed grit and made a noise with your mouth. Endeavor to feel the pattern as heart, a most fond interest which, in this enchanted beige, the desert greens itself to be, green as the face of absinthe, green as roadside cheek grass in this creepy weather. Soon, these fields will burn themselves, innocent as fire relax, endeavor, determined to love the implacable, the unnoticeable. Ignore what the deserts whisper to each other each time I say I love you. When you hang towels and bras from doorknobs, themselves refractive, cheap crystals, the straps and corners make a music of clicks when the window is thrown open onto a full, loving, arid wind. Your intimates of a fabric with the signs and wonders this real desert has on offer. So enchantment has to include, I guess, the familiar goodbyes of winds come and gone. It's a practice of renunciation I've come both to hate and believe in when I give a finger or ten back to the winds that made them weather veins in the first place, the special repatriation at the tip of my finger's touching core. Like a burial, a touch at air is just another practice of abundance and variety, the opposite of hate and hating my body. Abundance itself must be some force of determined enchantment, minus a list of words like enchantment. A listened in void, roughing up the ears, which prefer to hear what they wanted to hear. What a strange responsibility for a sense organ to bear. You might lop it off to spite the overheard. The reasonable appliance like hum at the center of the poem clicks on and off all night. The hollow at the center of air forced throughout the house, a revenant of a revenant, a brown noise alongside the actions of an acute and a sleeping mind, clinging too hard to being awake. A damn fool overhearing my listening, but that's an ancient feeling. Like skin and day, an arbitrary measure, earshot, sure, or echolocation, anything to get out from under the eye and its light. Sun, the surveilling enemy of the, sky, of the moon in the sky called the moon. Moon, only there in the height of the sun's lax oversight. So this listening is determined dusk work, invisible, crepuscular measure, maybe a better way to steal back the ear's touch, its sensitive love, from the full sun, bright but only part, a half measure mistaken for an obvious example. Stand out of my light. But since our ears are only passers-by on this old world, which aerates the brain as it twirls round on its spiny top, the head a perch for occasional wisps, we hope and sense we must be of a piece with our dumb statements and mercenary friends, people who say things like, all society's problems started with a walk, man. <laughs> Even if you're that kind of mirror hearer and demi-moron, and you put your ideas on your head like a helmet of determination, you're still of a piece with the unshielded. It makes a detail wrinkle on my head, but I like solace, so I trust that air is still meddlesome, and still or unsettled, it strikes your face and that strikes my fancy. So it's not going to do much besides make me feel better about looking like an old fool or a young fool, depending on the level of attention to time. Just so, my attempt to focus on stealing my overhearing back, on peeling back the canal's layer of wax, fail, fail to drag. The poem wasn't supposed to be polemic. It was supposed to be about ears finding their independence from the will. Fail, fail, glare, hear. These are letters. Official, tiny, precise, parabolic microphones. What sense? Blow your nose and the shape of your belly changes. Each organ on or in our bodies wants to gather pulses, measures, sounds, blood, food, maybe a baby's life. So I eat this hamburger, 
put on this winter weight and say the only thing that's not the end. It's not the only end, I said. And anyway, what's an end when listened to and listening are both a funeral and a christening? <laughs> Thank you. I promised that none of the others are that long. <laughs> The poem is called Minotaro Machia. There was a series of Picasso drawings about how the Minotaur was created. Doesn't have anything to do with that. I found myself here like guano, one sun, a causal arrow pointing, a pile of commemorative tones, yayoi, and the bull was deceived. Yayoi, are you not curled in nostalgias? Several horns or tusks dandruff and eyeglasses. That El Nino's greeny Paul. I found myself here like guano. My incredulity was a thorn. I was sure I was mortal and surprised I'm one of you. In the afternoon, a wind blows through earbuds. Um, I was trying not to lose my mind in this small, extremely hot town when I was writing this book. <clears throat> the poem is called The Book, The Book, The Book. <laughs> the Book. Books. Okay. The world is somewhere knocking around in its large history. Defiant fear is like yap, yap, yap. It made a decision to write lots of poetry about emerging dangers. Gaia. Canonical leaves. Lots of poetry circumnavigates the dumpster and bends. The wind smells like warm, expanding strawberry banana yogurt containers. <laughs> They've been doing that for years. <laughs> Lots of species were reading the forms of a greasy bag. Caught them in their stalks. Friendly, non-arachnid hamburger thorax. It comes at us from everywhere. Readings, unfamiliar walking. People are crying out, washing oil from feathers. And emergent feathers read the sky feral with slicked back wings, with wings wetted down. If anyone is a Blue Oyster Circle fan here, you'll notice I've already made five references to Blue Oyster Circle <laughs> lyrics at this point. Our seed heads produce a nagging, entropic demand. People seem to think it would be a fun game or a funny adventure if it all went up in smoke. Their mouths rimmed with hair gel. We can live off that if we need to. <laughs> Disaster. The fallen to earth star thistle. So rude in its urges. Our companionable responsibility secretes a friendship with it. Swollen horse mouth. Death God's mouth like a bead of sweat in the parking lot behind the grocery outlet. Mouth like a deathbed. The emergency. It had reached a crisis. Had the emergency reached a crisis? Crisis, it had grown up and become rather a lily, a scarf with printed jewelry billowing like it rude its sentience. I'll just read a couple more poems here. The poem's called Herm, like the crossroads marker, which eventually started out, you know, it's like a cairn, and then it was a sculpture of. Hermes with an erection. Herm. We walked openly and for no reason to form in the prowl of t in the prowl of talk an owl's head insignia, which is one way to say we took a walk, or that rabbit brush dusted our sleeves with pyramidal hints, with imitative and contagious music, which gave these knights in their broad coolness a gift to come into, a bee sting on an Adam's apple. We loped to propose a question. If the poem is an axis, what are the lines which cross it? It's immersions, it's a long sideness. And I take upon me this speaking for both of us, confined as we are to this poem. It's crossed figurations, it's eye encircled constellating, crossed and recrossed by the paths and pits of spy novels, of hot wings, of little cuts of grease in the cuticles, my coat leaking feathers, of any decorative response. 
I push one fingernail under the other and feel some pressure on my foot. Either the sock is too big or the shoe is too small. Knowledge outpacing a desire to know. A walk's aim. A creeping deliverance. A fresh set of tracks at angles, willy-nilly, party-eyed to within an inch of home. Genial squiggles turn inside the wit which animates such a walk. Its etymologies and hidden laws heaped up in the thousand-fold litter, or the lichens or tiny pebbles in a cairn. Will they allow us to well up in us unfurling this flag, this Russian roulette we're playing with a crystal ball? The words at war seem to shrink from memory forth to possession, but we are not at war. We are at the path, at the stump, at the ford, at the rise, where we are at rest in this poem as spiders crawl from my clothes. Wan joy, they scatter toward the mutable shade. This neighborhood's outskirts are full of hawks. There's always music playing. Is this retelling of the walk an accompaniment? Either I am accompanying your sitting down with a tale of nouns achieved on a walk, or you are the destination of this poem in which interest disguises hope and spandrels full of powerful feathers and the phlegmatic faces of the seraphim fill the roof of heaven. They seem so calm in their energetic heat, circling the throne and chanting. Does that fire-making motion radiate out and down? Well, the hot skin on my neck says yes, and that such a walk is an emulation, itself an accompaniment, aspirant to the form of a finch's flight, full of loping dignity, a dream of great personal fastidiousness that shadows my trust as I fall towards you, having stumbled over a large walk. The shadow of my trust falls about you, very ably laughing it together, laughing it together, in a single form. So there is this kind of relentlessness, the owl talk, the commerce with the dead, with the resolutely inhuman, the creatures and stones, our dead friend, that son of a boy who shadowed us as we skirted the city, considering his ears and ours made for details, that he must still hear the music and hawks in his death, hear the yogurt falling like snot onto my zipper, mm -hmm. And whose white hair is this? Caught between my nose and the bridge of my glasses. Like it, you see me, the poem made by Jared, only by shadow, umbra solis, or by moon, so as to quiet what a reader prompts in the words that form. Let morning be morning, a shape at rest. The stars reflected in a shovel aren't dim, they don't exist. <laughs> And I'll just read one more poem here. This is a book full of manifestos of one kind or another. I can't decide on the name of this poem, so I'm not going to read the name. I don't think it's necessary. One reason to gain years... I dedicate this to Christina when we were talking about our... Uh, our, uh, our uh, the way that we love our, our venerated old poets, so this is about, <laughs> it just uses the word venerable, it has you know, something to do with it, in the sense that the word is, appears. <laughs> One reason to gain years and to become venerable and majestic is that you can go all various horizontal and omnidirectional with your geomantic peculiarities. <laughs> <laughs> So I went to Nevada, almost at will, <laughs> almost an adept of years, a colt or filly cantering Hyundai-wise by a road cut. <laughs> the very picture of geologic scale. I'm pretty sure I'm a sorcerer, so I'm getting a lot of job offers here. <laughs> but the only thing I quiver to do are some hollow imitations of my own indivisibility by treating a list of visible trees as an obstacle course, a test of skill, mimicry, imitation, and group psychosis. I keep your shape, Apple. Your leaves get covetous of high country blue catalpa. You are a poor ornamental Siberian elm. Help me become the lower atmosphere's furrier cottonwood. It's either these tests of skill or sleep 
beneath a fur with cones, which disintegrate at maturity to release winged seeds, besides which kids walk with otter pops in blue and orange. It's touching and various out on the lawn, these years like this, like something a dog would do, an open trick composed of ears that hang in and scratch out the asymmetrical eyes of air. If you're hearing with one swinging lance of pure capture, more towards the reader's interest than the, fly, the small flies that glint the world full of all my catching, all my wing, all my droplets in this fruit, then it's August, complete as a stranger I encrust with my heart. And just so you know I am who I say I am, a starling gurgles and enters the conversation. Small insects flit from burr to burr, a scrap of rags thrown over a shard of star thistle. But that's how it is to scatter out toward the mandate of inanimate friendship. Thank you. the kind of grandson of Joe Cocker <laughs> enactment. I may resist myself. Um, so I, I'm going to read a few poems from a, a forthcoming, well first I want to thank uh, Christina for that beautiful, seamless, eloquent introduction and Jared for reading with me and Stephanie for having me to her class. It was really terrific grilling I got. <laughs> um, and I, so I'm gonna read a little bit from a forthcoming collection called Shall Cross, um, which I think of as being in tandem with a prose work, but I'm not sure um, if they are, but I think of them as being in conversation with a prose book that I'm publishing that I can never remember the title of, so I have to read it. It's the poet, the lion, talking pictures, El Feralito, a wedding in St. Rock, the big box store, the warp in the mirror, spring, midnight's fire, and all. And every time I try to shorten it, I keep adding to it. I'm thinking maybe I should make the whole thing a title and just have a word at the end for the text, <laughs> which has always been a dream of mine to do that. Um, so I'm going to read a few poems from uh, this collection, Shall Cross, and then I'm going to do something that's sort of anathema at a reading is to read the beginning and the ending of a, a book called One with Others, which is a kind of single text. Obscurity and Empathy. The left hand rests on the paper. The hand has entered the frame just below the elbow. The other hand is in its service. The left hand moves along a current that is not visible and on a signal likewise inaudible goes still. For the hand to respond, the ink must be black. There is no watermark. One nail is broken well below the quick, the others filed short or chewed. The hand is drawn to objects. In another's it becomes pliant and readily absorbs the moisture of the others. It retains the memory of the smell of her infant son's hair. Everything having been written, the hand has to work hard to get up in the spaces. There is no tremor, but the skin is thin and somewhat crepey. The veins stand out. The hand has begun to gesture toward its ghosthood, though at times it becomes almost frisky. The desk is side-lit. The hand has options, but has chosen to stay inside its own pale, thin walls. It has begun to show signs of its own shoddy construction. The hand is there to express shouts and whispers, ordinary love, the after image of everything. From the outside, what light leaks through the blind is blue, blue-gray. There is a dog. There is a fan. The fan is on the dog. Mm -hmm. 
obscurity and shelter. It's the moon that is incommunicado. It looks so natural. I see a woman reading a book. It's early yet. They could walk to the water. It's at the brink of a memory she doesn't want to call up. It's still light, trailing scarves of fog. It's not too late, blow between her eyes. It's growing more insistent. The face is always there. It's the same house, skeletal but secure, where he grew up, a one-story clapboard with stuff crammed into drawers, waiting for the adults to go out. Never enough closets, so he could roll a smoke or call her, pull the door to, and start sprouting a mustache. Who ate to the tail straight from the fridge, trout skin, flesh cartilage, always against everything on multiple channels. As one's intentions are so often obscured to oneself, wanting what one wants, the closeness, the warmth that takes place before fire, a world before his candle, it's the rhea that's heard beyond the tree line, the water folding back, a blanket that waits for the body, half listening, overflowing its archipelagos, rhea in Galician, drowned valley. Obscurity and Providence. The hand is immobilized, so the hand, not usually in use, has to do all the work, has learned to wait, to be quiet, to be still, to receive memories, to tend the fire, sometimes perceiving a vague presence. The hand extends in the perceived direction, retreats, pulls a sheet of paper from the drawer that sticks wet or dry, scribbling fast at last, what is he doing now, that now that it is cold? Where does he sleep? When the dressing comes off, the smell is really pug. Obscurity and incarceration. There was a spring at the top of the hill, water colder than it sounds, once lying on his back, hands behind his head, watching masses of clouds push themselves around. Once caught a snake in the Joe Pye weed, about as big around as an ankle monitor. Once found a mess of arrowheads above the Calico Bluffs. Never minded being by his own self, never minded his own company. Once he was a hellion, all right, but he had something. He had flow all by himself. Once he had a girl, but this here wasn't enough. Not that anyone ever asked, not that anyone ever would. What was it exactly he thought he was missing? He would tell them what. He missed kissing, big time. He missed kissing. This is a, a poem I was wrote for the Smithsonian to commemorate the Civil War. I've never been a Civil War buff, and I never wanted to be married to a reenactor, uh, <laughs> ever. But I did, um, when they, he asked me to write it, I, it was a challenge, so I wanted to write it. And um, so I started reading about Arkansas, where I'm originally from in the Civil War, um, which in the part of the state I'm from played a very ambivalent role in it. Most people ran away. Some people joined the North, some people joined the South, but they joined the South often um, upon a pain of death if they didn't, because the governor passed a law that any runaways would be shot. So uh, I just tried to imagine a person very unsuited uh, for fighting this war. Obscurity and legacy. To get up, again, to get up. To get up on legs that stretched, strode, and straddled. To unplug the mud from the end of the barrel, again, which would involve having hands or having a hand. One that understood the consistency of mud, also what sprang from the same consistency, the hand that hung their door at an angle, that gawkily shore the lamb, a hand that had warmed itself in the cavities of a fallen man with barely suppressed feelings of kinship and revulsion. 
The same hand that dug a spud from an abandoned mound to eat with clods adhered to its skin, a hand that felt secure only if not near peerless holding a pin, felt natural, numerous, never ending, that peeled the skin off a birch after the writing paper was finished, that he might inscribe his ardency adieu, that would drift past as a strip of Sharpie, then drift past a window as a clean white shirt bearing a husband, freshly bathed and shaved, to get up again on the undestroyed elbow, red and raw from the unpatched uniform forced into wearing, to be beside oneself, to be up on one raw red elbow, to have been forced into uniform beside blown off parts of oneself, before being blown away not knowing parts of his lonely body were gone, his busted up bookish being fleeing, and once blown over the furrows, once the creek crested so little would be left, plowshare, broken coulter, a few useless silver over objects from an all but involuntary wedding, and now never to come back to the everlasting paradigm of the nearness of a known body, leaf on leaf worm by worm snow on snow, now be the woman thoroughly exhausted, drained, discolored, defeated, to have gotten up, to have gone to her dresser before getting up again and hoisting her hoe to the wrecked field, to have gone to her dresser before seeing her racked visage, now be the shoulders dusted as shoulders can glare, be the credit scroll slowly and boldly by the air expanding at supersonic speed, be the windows let up in the tree, the centenarian tree dependably there, the tree there, the tree just standing there, the chestnut from which she descended leaf on leaf, worm by worm snow on snow, born for what resplendent reason to irrigate this dumb mud with his oblivious blood, who always thought he would once again get up after sucking her breast, after putting away his nibs, after an unexceptional dinner with friends, die in the snow. So um, I'll, I'll read a few pages from the beginning and the end of, of this book, One with Others, a little book of her days which was originally um, set out to be a tribute to a, a very iconoclastic friend of mine named Peggy Vitito. But I couldn't write about Peggy Vitito without writing about the context of her life in eastern Arkansas, the Arkansas Delta, and especially that moment in which she was the most engaged, which was the year following Martin Luther King's assassination, when the little towns up and down the Delta exploded in one fashion or another. Um, she was uh, uh, born of an um, Irish and German Catholic family. Her husband was also Catholic. They were totally incompatible. They had seven children, which meant there was, there was also no way to um, part. <laughs> uh, so there's a, I'll read one of the epigraphs from it and then the first few pages. So it is mostly about the, uh, some events that went down in this town in eastern Arkansas, one of the uh, more um, troubling ones was that uh, children from the black school went to the white school, locked arms, saying like a tree standing by the water. They were arrested en masse. There was no room for them at the jail, so they were driven around, and they couldn't transport them in the city buses, since of course the whole thing was illegal for them to be arresting them, so they transported them in sealed trucks and then didn't know what to do with them, so they drove them around for hours and hours and hours, and then they put them in the drained swimming pool and kept their gun sights on them. And then at night, they would take them into the Civic Center. They had never been in either, since those were white institutions. And uh, it was very traumatic, of course, n not as much for the children who were uh, with, you know, one with each other, uh, but very traumatic for, especially for the parents um, who were beside themselves. Um, so anyway, that's one little piece of the things that went on in this town during that time. And my friend, who was a white woman, stepped forward. And of course, she paid the price for it. Um, her husband divorced her. He denounced her on the radio. Uh, children lost custody of children. She had to leave town. She was driven across 
Uh, the state, well, uh, across the state, she was already in the Delta, so it was only 42 miles to Memphis, but she was driven to uh, supposedly the Tennessee line, which would have been the middle of the Mississippi River. So the state trooper who was Governor Rockefeller's uh, bodyguard drove her over to Memphis and told her never to come back to Arkansas. That was, so that was one little episode beyond the beyond, you know. So the little, one of the epigraphs is, I want people of 27 languages walking back and forth saying to one another, hello brother, how's the fishing? And when they reach their destination, I don't want them to forget if it was bad. And that's from the battlefield where the moon says I love you by Frank Stanford. Some names were changed or omitted in light of the interpretive nature of this account others because they still live there. People may have been rendered as semblances and composites of one another and others spoken into being. Memories have been tapped and newspapers consulted, books referenced, times fused and towns overlaid. This is not a work of history, it is a report full of holes, a little commemorative edition, and it aspires to the borrowed tuxedo lining, lining of fiction. In the end, it is a welter of associations. Up and down the towns in the Delta, people were stirring. Cotton was right about shoe top, day lilies hung from their withering necks, temperatures started out in the 90s with no promise of a good soaking. School was almost out. The farm bells slowly rang for freedom. The king lay moldering in the ground over a year. The scent of liberation stayed on, but it was hard to bring the trophy home. Hard to know what came next. One thing and on, one thing only was known. No one wanted to go home dragging their toe sack. No one wanted to go home empty-handed. Over at the All Negro Junior High, a popular teacher has been fired for insubordination for a derogatory letter he wrote the superintendent saying the Negro has no voice, no voice at all. It was the start of another cacophonous summer. It smells like home, she said, dying. And I, what's that you smell, V? And V, dying. The faint cut of walnuts in the grass, my husband's work shirt on the railing the pulled barbecued evening, the turned dirt. Even in this pitch, I can see the vapor-lit pole, the crepe myrtle not in shadow, my sweet Betsy, that exact streak sky, the mongrel dog being pelted with rain, mine eyes pelted, all fear overcome at last, no scent. That's what she said, dying in the one-room apartment in Hell's Kitchen. I came in by the old road from Memphis, the old military road, across the iron bridge, no one in the field, not a living soul. I drove around with the windows down, the red buds in bloom, sky a discolored chenille spread, weather generally fair. The marchers step off from the jailhouse at Bragg's Spur at 17 a.m., more police than reporters, more reporters than police. The self-described Prime Minister, the invaders, 31, and five others have begun their trek. Sweet Willie Wine's walk against fear is on the move. The threat, they say, is coming from, from the east of the six Negroes walking to Little Rock and the white woman driving a station wagon. It was something you came through that. V, it was invigorating. It was the most alive I ever felt in my life. FBI followed me for a long time, stringers for the Gazette and the Appeal trailed me for a year. Once every 10 or 12 years, I will get a collar. I used all of my life. I told my friend Gert, you've got your life until you use it. I park in a spot of shade and walk around, downtown half shut down, cotton gin still going, not strong, but going. Tracks working, neglected, but working. The infamous overpass brought down. September 15, 2004, Hell's Kitchen, her life surrendered to her body. September 15, the De Padre Hidalgo uttered the firmest grito that kicked off the Mexican Revolution. She would have liked that, going off the air on a day marking a great struggle for independence. The river rises from a mountain of granite. The river receives the water of the little river, the house where my friend once le lived indefinitely empty, walnuts turning dark in the grass, papers collected on the porch. If I put my face to the glass, I can make out the ghost of her ironing board bottle of bourbon on the end. 
Her former husband, I'd come home from work and she would be in a rage and I just couldn't understand it. They were a poor match, she says so to this day, she said so then. They barely tolerated one another, but they were Catholic, another error bred in the bone. If he looked at her and she looked at him, in nine months she was back at the lying in. <laughs> My best guess, she woke up in a rage eight days a week. Her friends, the musician, the poet, the actor, Gert, she taught me how to live. Now she has taught me how to die. And die, she was my Goomba, my Rafiki. It was the honor of my life to know her, honor of my life. Ellis, a crowd will gather and not know it walks the very street whereon a thing once walked that seemed a burning cloud. Yates, she knew inside out, inside out. A man known as Skeeter his whole life. Oh yeah, I remember her. She celebrated all her kids' birthdays on the same day. <laughs> I talked to a number of people in person, on the phone, mostly the phone. When I could get anyone to talk to me, I made so many calls. Can we talk later because I'm trying to cook for my family. He's not here now, he's fishing. I've got to go to the hospital to see my brother. He's about to pass. I've got to go to Memphis. I've got to work the night shift out at the Big Pen. I worked there since the plant shut. Can we talk later? I'm on neighborhood watch, and the kids are walking out. There's no food here. I'm left holding the bot baby. You'll have to speak to the hand. This was my rest day. He's fishing. I'm working at the poles. I'm on pole watch. I've got to go to Little Rock for my checkup. My pressure's gone up. Since he got laid off, he's always fishing. When he can't go home, he's watching the fishing channel. So how is the fishing? <laughs> so how is the fishing? Oh, well, you know, it's lots worse elsewhere. The woman who lived next door to the old house came outside to pick up her paper, asked if she had known my friend who lived there in the 60s, and she allowed that she did. Flat out, she said she didn't trust me, and I didn't trust her. Mm -hmm. Then she surprised me, saying she was right, we were wrong. I heard just a fraction of the terrible things that happened back then, a fraction. Then she shot me, saying, they have souls just like us. Skip a little. The only sure thing were the prices and the temperatures. A pound, two pounds of oleo cost 25 cents, and five cans of Cherokee freestone peaches are a dollar. The Cosmos Club president held a tea at her lovely lakeside home. Two more big tree boys make fine soldiers. A rolling stone was found in the bottom of his swimming pool. Rufus Thomas and his bear cats will headline at the Negro Fair, and Miss Teenage Arkansas, a comely young miss, is saluted once more for her charm and pulchritude. <laughs> Sunshine Fresh Hydrox cookies, one pound for 59 cents. The assistant warden at 300 pounds is the one identified for adm administering the strap at the Arkansas Pen, a self-sustaining institution. Several say they were beaten for failing to meet cotton quotas. Others, more often than not, did not know why they were beaten. One testified to more than 70 beatings. The strap is not in question. In question is when it is to be administered. The river is impounded by the lake. Below the lake, the river enters the lowlands. It slithers through cypress and willow, and the air itself cl cloudy or clear, stirring with smoke or dust, or malathion, if you get my drift, must not be construed to be indivisible. No more than blood, there is black blood and white blood. There is black air and white air. This includes the air and the tires blowing out over the interstate between town and river, the air that riddles the children when a crop duster buzzes a schoolyard, the air that bellows from the choir of robes when the very reverend pillows bids be seated, and even the air socked from the jaw of the champ, born 17 miles west in San Slough, when he took that phantom punch, the year in which this particular round of troubles began. Today, gentle reader, the sermon once again, segregation after death. For me, it has always been a series of doors. If one is open precipitously, a figure is caught bolting from bed. If another, a small table, a list of demands on school paper. If another, a child on the linoleum saying she wants a white doll. A woman sitting on a bed holding a folded flag, a shelf of trophies behind her head, an ironing board bottle of bourbon on the end, sewing machine on a porch. 
to walk down the road without fear, to sit in a booth and order a sweet soft drink, to work at the front desk, to be referred to as gentlemen, to swim in the pool, to sit in the front row and watch run wild, run free, next week death of a gunfighter, to make your way to the end of the day with both eyes in your head. Nothing is not integral. You want to illumine what you see, fear reflected off an upturned face, those walnuts turning black in the grass, it is a relatively stable world, gentle reader, but beyond that door, it defies description. I am standing in a sluggish line at the Memphis airport. It is too early. A little girl in a pink suit with tawny corkscrew curls stands behind me. I wish you would just shut up, she says to the stuffed bear she holds. Her, mo her mother and I exchange holy moly looks. I sway between standing and falling. I'm flashing the black paintings before they were transferred onto canvas in a cock-called helmet. Sweet baby JC, a frowsy bush of sweet Betsy, and an old activist with a sober kit, sweet willy wine. There are endless rows of cotton and never enough shade or cool, cool water, and rivers silting up and slowing to a standstill, daytime bourbon drinkers, smelly shirts and scrap dogs, clouds of malathion and moccasins in the storm cellar, mussels as big as dinner dishes, a land of layoffs and morbid obesity, sharp-tongued undertakers, don't pick up hitchhikers, correction facility signs, gentlemen who could not be called gentlemen without it coming back on them, women who could never be called ma'am, rusted iron bridges, toeheads, do-rags, tired out school books, kids put in a drain pool, a pool buried and paved over, Brothers scared shitless jumping off an overpass to get away from armed, malevolent men. Brothers hiding under the preacher's pickup, blackbirds flashing their red shoulders, speckled bowling balls, segregation after death, and how the death of reason produces monsters. Thank you.